here's your next video, next lecture for cardio 212, cardiovascular assessment. Okay, biggest thing, open-ended questions. History of present illness. We want to know open-ended. We don't want to say, uh, did it start at 3 o'clock? Uh, does it feel like something's on your chest? You want to do it open. Like, how does it feel? You know, when did it start? What were you doing? What's the quality? I think quality and severity are the hardest things for anybody to wrap around their brains. Um, sharp, dull, pressure, burning, tightness, squeezing, heaviness, stabbing, etc. Some people say when they're having an MI, it feels like an elephant's on their chest. Others might say that it feels like somebody's poking them. Okay. I think it's really hard, these subjective kind of questions. Radiation and relieving factors. Is there anything that's making it feel better? Anything that's making it feel worse? When you sit down, does it feel better? But when you start walking, it makes it feel worse. That's very important. That really tells us what's going on with the patient. Severity, I hate this. What is between 1 and 10? You know, some people are at 10 and they're eating a sandwich and taking selfies. Another person's two might be that they can't even look you in the eye because it hurts so bad and they're grimacing. Okay, so it's very subjective. I personally hate subjective questions. I hate going to the eye doctor because I feel it's all subjective questioning, but you know, I need glasses so I have to go. Although I have been threatening with her. I said people can go on the moon, but we can't figure out their eyeglasses by just a little machine. Yeah. <laughs> Not a very good patient. Anyway, timing. How long does it last? When they do get chest pain, how long does it last? Is it continual? Does it stop? You know, they're all really good questions that really help establish what's going on with them. Past medical history. If you ask my mother, she has no heart issues whatsoever. She does have a pacemaker. She has three stints. She's on... Oh, let's see. She's on Levastin and aspirin. So to her, she doesn't have any heart, cardiac history. I had to break it to her a couple times. That, yeah, you do. Okay. So a lot of times we find out they have cardiac history by just looking at their medications. You know, are they on aspirin? Are they on a statin? Are they on fish oil? You know, why are they on fish oil? You know, some people will even tell you that they don't have hypertension. Well, they're taking lisinopril, met metropolol, and amylodipine, but hey, they don't have high blood pressure. Well, no, they don't have high blood pressure because they're taking um, an ACE inhibitor, calcium channel blocker, and a, what else did I name? ACE inhibitor, calcium channel, oh, and a beta blocker. And what about other chronic illnesses they have? Diabetics are notorious for cardiac issues. They're notorious for all kinds of issues, but definitely cardiac issues. Renal failure. You know, that really pays a part in whenever they are, we're helping them with hypertension or, you know, a uh, if they're having an MI, you know, really does play a part. And they're also more apt to have cardiac illnesses, bleeding disorders, rheumatic fever. We're going to find out that rheumatic fever and strep infections cause um, valve problems. Radiation treatments to the chest. The radiation treatments to the chest aren't necessary for the heart. What happens is that it messes with the um, anatomy of the heart. So it damages the anatomy of the heart. And surgical history. It's funny when you have people and you ask them if they have any surgical history and they know, I don't have any, I've never had, but then they have gallbladder, um, gallbladder incisions. Um, trying to think of the one one had an nephrectomy. I don't know how she failed to mention that, but anyway. Social history. Family history. Is there a history of CAD, hypertension, CVA, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, sudden death below the age of 60? This is all important. One way, a lot of this, um, a lot of these medic, I'm sorry, a lot of these diseases for the heart can be genetically linked. Okay, let's face it, there's some that no matter what, you got the good parts and the bad parts of your parents. Cardiac history is one of them. Not only that, though, but if they have a patient that their parents had hypertension and CAD, okay, or that they died of a heart attack less than 60 years of age, 
The thing is, they were brought up into an environment which that's what they know to eat. Okay, maybe it's going to Long John's three times a week. Maybe it's having hamburger helper. Listen, I love hamburger helper, but let's face it, it's not very good for you. And by the way, I don't eat meat either, so we'll talk about that some other time. So anyway, that kind of stuff, if that's how they're brought up, looking on the side of a hamburger helper thing, it's a death sentence if you eat it more than once a week. Okay? So a lot of that family history has to do with how they are brought up. Do they exercise? Do they go for walks? Or is their walking going to the couch and getting their remote control? Okay? Smoking. I hate to tell you if you're a smoker, you're going to hear it from me a million times to stop smoking. I was a former smoker. I get it. But quite honestly, I don't think I could go back to it because of all the things I've seen with these smokers. Okay? Smoking does not help anything, and I don't think anybody can say they're better off because they've been smoking. Not that I'm preaching. Like I said, I was a smoker too. Alcohol use. Is it a habitual thing? Do they, are they drinking every night, or are they drinking on the weekends, or are they just a social drinker? Maybe they just drink on holidays, okay? Dietary habits. What do they eat? What do they like to eat? Are they a red, red meat kind of person? Or are they just chicken, okay? Or maybe they they don't eat meat. I don't eat meat. And though I'm overweight, my um, lipid panel is beautiful. Go figure. But anyway, um, so what do they eat? Do they like leafy green vegetables? Or do they only like green beans that have lard in it and are cooked from a can, okay? Exercise, what do they consider exercise? Is going to Walmart their exercise? I mean, hey, you can get a lot of steps in on Walmart, but is that their exercise? Okay. Activity levels, what can they do? Do they do, you know, are they able to go shopping? You know, I think, and I hate to say it, and I know you guys are going to hate me for this, but I think that pickup, Walmart pickup is like one of the worst things we can do for America because of the fact that people that don't normally get out and walk, that's their only exercise. Okay, so now we're even limiting that. And don't start talking to the computer about how it's more convenient and you can't do it. Trust me, I raised four kids and without the pickup, it's doable. Um, and don't send hate mail because of that, but it is doable. Okay, socioeconomic factors. What do they eat? Are they eat the 99 cent bologna from Walmart because they can't afford fresh vegetables? You know, are they eating those little Vienna sausages at Walmart because they're only like 39 cents a can? Disgusting, but they are 39 cents a can or something like that. They were really cheap when I worked there. You know, what exactly are they eating? You know, maybe um, they're eating the 99 cent menu at McDonald's because it's cheaper for them to eat that way than to cook a whole meal. You know, what's what's going on with them? We can't expect them to eat kale if their living expenses do not allow them to buy kale. Quite honestly, I'm not a fan of kale anyway, so if I did have the if I did have a million dollars, I don't think I still would buy kale. But anyway, mm -hmm. so those are things that we have to look at. And just to go back, we can't expect them if they have an MI. And that's what they're used to, to change it overnight. But we'll talk about that with MIs. Okay, chest, cardinal symptoms of heart disease. Chest pain. Um, when I first started with, um, in CSU, I thought everybody would die. If you had chest pain, that means you were going to die. One way or the other, you were dying. And in fact, when I worked on the oncology unit, they would send us a chest pain person that was like troponins were negative, everything was negative. But to me, they were going to die. You know, why are they sending them to us? I don't know what to do with them. Um, but guess what? Chest pain is not all about the heart. Chest pain can be referred pain from cervical um, back, back injuries. It could be because of GERD. There's a lot of things. Heart murmur. Heart murmur, though, it, it does deal with the heart. Not, not, it's not, can be asymptomatic until um, it starts becoming a problem. Dyspnea, well, we can think of dyspnea of different reasons. Pneumonia, 
It could be because of COPD or it could be heart related, diaphoresis, low sugar, right? Or it could be heart, lightheadedness, dizziness. It could have been anything from standing up really quick, you know, standing up really quick to, uh, well, it could be because of um, low sugar also. But there's a lot of things that could be dizziness, okay? Syncope, you know, what happened? Was it low sugar? Was it your heart that caused you to have syncope? Um, there's uh, other reasons, palpitations, edema, cyanosis, clubbing. Clubbing could be heart disease, but it's more of a hallmark sign for respiratory issues. Cough, hypnopticis, no matter what hypnopticis is, think back, back to the your medical terminology it's bloody sputum fatigue well heck i could be fatigued right now it doesn't mean it's my heart it could be because i didn't get up last night or go to sleep last night i got up last night I didn't go to sleep last night until very late so all of these are different marks okay differential diagnosis when a person comes in with chest pain we want to see what's exactly going on with that so we will first go for an mi We'll look at EKGs, we'll look at troponins, things like that. But then once that happens and then we see that's all negative, then we have to look elsewhere, okay? Um, could it be because of GERD? Could it be because of pectal ulcer? Could it be because of liver disease, pulmonary embolus, um, any kind of inflammations of the muscles, hyperventilation or cervical disc disease? Those are all differential diagnoses, which means that you know, it's not the heart, but what could it be, okay? Physical exam. As soon as you walk in that, that room, you're going to start examining your patient, okay? By just saying hi, that's where you start your exam. Remember when you had Sharon and you would go head to toe? I mean, literally, didn't we all just go head to toe? We looked at your head and then went to your face and then went down. No, we're doing a head to toe by just walking into the patient's room. Okay, by talking to them. Then we're going to look. We're going to palpate. We're going to listen to their pulses. Okay, when I say pulses, we're going to look at it, listen to their heart rate. We're going to palpate their pulses, rate, strength, rhythm, measure their, um, their blood pressure, inspect neck veins. By looking at their neck veins, we can actually see if they are in CHF, uh, core pulmonale or any other kind of um, disease processes. We palpate pericardial apex. Listen for a thrill, okay? Could they be having any kind of blockages? Also take pericardial and apex. Palpate peripheral pulses and listen for the brewy. And examine for venous insufficiency, okay? All things that we do when we first look at patient. The first, when you listen to the heart, the first thing we hear is a lub, okay? That's the sound of the AV nodes closing. It's the beginning of systole. Remember, systole is the contraction, okay? Heard loudest at the apex of the heart, so the, basically the bottom part of the heart. Cuspid valves sound left lower sternal. So if you were listening to, um, if you wanted really to hear the lub, we're looking at the fourth intercostal um, space. Mitral valve clothing, closing, if we want to hear that, we're going to look at the fifth intercostal space. Second sound is the dub. That's the closure of the semilunar valves. It's the end of systole and beginning of diastole. So it's the ending of the contraction and the beginning of the relaxation phase. Heard loudest, loudest at the base, lub dub. And if we want to hear the pulmonic valve, it's the second left intercostal space. And the aortic valve is the second right intercostal space. And there's your different places where you can hear the valves. We want to hear the valves because we want to hear if there's any um, murmurs, if there's any regurgitation happening because of those valves. Or maybe there's stenosis. If there's stenosis, we'll hear a thrill, okay, of like fluid going through a smaller area. Systole, we talked about it. Contraction phase of the heart starts with the closure of the AV valves after SI. Remember, I told you you guys need to know what which ones your valves, uh, where your valves are located, because this is very important going forward. Okay, diastole is the filling phase of the ventricles, so it's the relaxation. Okay, 
This is where the blood is coming into the ventricles before the contraction. Okay, other heart sounds. There's a three, S3 gallop. That usually happens with CHF or regurgitation. Um, the S4 gallop, atrial contraction, abnormal in adults, you can hear it in pediatrics, indicates resistance to ventricular filling. Okay, could happen because of hypertension. And then um, with that, you'll hear the lub dub dub. And it sounds like Tennessee is what you're going to hear. Murmurs, abnormal. Okay, generally when you talk about murmurs, people are really happy to let you hear their murmurs, which is kind of odd. Um, and friction rub. And when we're talking about a friction rub, we're talking about pericarditis, which is the inflammation of the pericardium. Other heart sounds, murmurs, and I just talked about it. Um, murmurs can be graded from one to six, okay? So one being, yes, you have a murmur and you're able to do your ADLs to, we gotta do surgery at six, okay? We gotta do surgery, um, you're not doing well, you're not able to do your ADLs or anything else. Pericardial rub, that's the inflammation of the pericardial sac. And when we talk about that, it's generally with pericarditis. Okay, inspect for obvious abnormalities. Oscillate, identify S1 and S2, identify presence of additional sounds. Do you hear any swishing, any thrill and brewies? Oscillate all four sites for cardiac sounds. Document apical rate and rhythm. Now, sometimes your heart rate's going so fast that you can't document, you can't count that fast, especially when I think of um, newborns and their heart rate, okay? One way to get around that, I don't I hate to say it, get around it, let's say we're using our resources, is to use our telemetry monitors. If a patient's on telemetry, we can use a telemetry monitor to know what the apical pulse rate is, okay? We don't want to rely on your um, peripheral pulses due to the fact that those peripheral pulses could be wrong, especially if you're talking about somebody that's in AFib, okay? Practice identification of the murmurs. Okay, blood pressure measurement, pulse pressure, orthostatic hypotension. So pulse pressure and orthostatic hypotension. Let's talk about orthostatic hypotension for a little bit. Let me just do a line. Okay, orthostatic hypotension, what we would see in orthostatic hypotension is generally in the elderly. What happens is they, whenever they stand up, because of their vessels not being as strong and their preload not being as adequate, as when they were younger, what will happen is their um, leaflets in their veins will allow the blood to go back, okay? They're not able to keep that pressure um, homeostasis, as you will, throughout your body. We can also um, expect orthostatic hypotension. When else, do you think? Just when I kind of look at you and kind of get your brain picking. But since we're not in the classroom, I will tell you, generally with um, when somebody is dehydrated, they'll have orthostatic hypotension. So if a patient, we suspect that they are dehydrated, we will do orthostatic, um, orthostatic vital signs. Just so we know, sorry, Eddie, um, definitively that it is, um, they are dehydrated. A mean, mean atrial pressure map shows us what exactly is going on in the vessels. And we don't do very much of it on our floor. If somebody tells you the map is elevated or is um, low, we are like, oh, whatever, you know, because we're not go, we're not generally on our unit, let's say they're stable enough for not watching it as often. In ICU, they will look at the map whenever they're titrating medications. Um, if they are on a vasoconstrictor medication, that they will try to get the blood pressure up. Or the fact that their blood pressure is so high, they're looking at the map to bring it down, okay? If you have too much of a, if your map was too high, what the map can show is that it can, ca be, it can cause organ damage. So we will titrate our medications to eliminate any organ damage if the map is too high. If it's too low, we will titrate medications to bring that map up high so that we know that the um, organs are being uh, perfused. Okay, skin assessment. Are they bluish? Are they grayish? Are they pink? Are they warm? 
okay? We're gonna look at all of that. You know, are they sweaty? Are they dry, okay? Well, it, skin is very telltale signs of um, what's going on with the patient. Okay, and we're gonna assess for JVD. What JVD is, is your jugular vein. Oh, man, I just didn't mean to do that. It's your jugular vein, um, jugular venous distension, okay? And we will talk a little bit more about that. Um, peripheral assessment, upper extremities, pulse deficits, capillary refill, unilateral swelling. Are both legs swollen? Is one leg swollen? Is one arm swollen? Is the other, what about the other one? You know, is it swollen? Is it, the pulse is the same? We're gonna look at all of it, okay? Lower extremities pulse is an edema. Is the edema because of heart failure or is it because of PVD, okay? We're gonna look and, you know, it really tells us a lot about our patients and head and neck. We can listen to um, the carotids to see if we hear any brewies, which means there's an occlusion. I don't wanna say occlusion, a narrowing, okay? And it's causing the um, blood to, Put out a brewy sound. Documented pulses can be graded on a four-point scale. Bounding, not necessarily a good thing. Remember, too much of a good thing is a bad thing. Are they increased? Are they normal? Are they weak? Are they absent? One thing you never want to do, you never want to chart absent and not get a Doppler. Okay, if you can't feel pulses, say in the pedal pulses, we got to figure out if they're getting blood flow down there. If they're not getting blood flow, they have to go to surgery or we're going to be cutting off their pedals, otherwise known as their legs, feet. Okay, CMS check. If there's any kind of injury, okay, we're going to check. Um, we're going to compare one, in, one leg to the other, one arm to another. We're going to assess their cap refill. Um, is it sluggish, absence? Are the pulses weak or absent? Numbness, tingling, inability to initiate no motion. You're gonna probably talk a lot about CMS check whenever you're talking in ortho. But for us, if a patient's going down for like a, what I call a rotor rotor of the arteries in their legs, okay, we're gonna do a CMS check to see if there's any, um, if, if, if it's perfusing correctly, or maybe the graft is leaking, okay? Well, like I said, unfortunately, we're going to talk about that. I've been saying that a lot.